Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Kristen Talbot. I am the Maven, the map, the program manager for Maven Project. Thank you all to, uh, for joining us today. And then thank you to our friends at Lynn Community Health Center for hosting today's session. Low back pain, high value primary care approach with Dr. Carrie Horwich. Dr. Horwich is an outpatient primary care physician. She's also a certified specialist in care for patients living with HIV. She's been in practice for over 30 years. She is a clinical associate professor of medicine at University of Washington, Seattle. And Dr. Horowitz was the governor for the Washington chapter of American College of Physicians from 2010 to 2014 and served on the American College of Physicians Board of Regents from 2014 to 2018. She's currently a member of the Board of Trustees for Washington State Medical Association. Her areas of interest are HIV, STDs, ethics, about ethics, clinician well-being, and public health. All right, Dr. Horwich, I will pull up your slide deck and when you are ready. Thank you so much, Kristen. Um, and I just wanna say, as we go through this talk, if people have questions um, during the talk, by all means, you can put them into uh, the chat or the Q&A, whatever is easier for you. And uh, so what this is gonna be is low back pain, which we know is a very common problem in, uh, especially in the outpatient setting. So I hope to give you a more high value care approach uh, for this. Uh, let's go to the next couple slides. This is just the disclosure of which I have none. And as you've already heard, Maven is the one crediting uh, this particular talk for today. Next slide. So what we're gonna to do today is we're going to talk a little bit about what red flags you should be aware of uh, when anybody's presenting with low back pain. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about what you should know about imaging, what may be appropriate or not appropriate uh, in some, some of the studies regarding that. And then also explain what is high value care and what are the needs for when you are thinking about workup treatment or imaging uh, for low back pain. So let's start, next slide. Let's start with just a couple definitions. So when we talk about pain, we usually try to uh, lump it into whether it's acute pain, which is usually something less than four weeks, subacute, four to 12 weeks, or chronic pain greater than 12 weeks. And that can sometimes make a difference in terms of your workup, as well as your management uh, when you're dealing with how long has this person had the pain. So not the acuity of the pain, just the length of time that they've had that. Next slide. So our first question for all of you, if you could type into the chat, what percentage of US adults will have one day of low back pain in the past three months? So if you could all start typing in the chat, what you think. Okay, you can either put in your percent or the ABCD, whatever seems to work best. Okay, so I'm seeing a lot of people um, stating either 50% or 75%, and I know it can seem that way sometimes in practice. Uh, next slide, the actual answer is 25%. So this is from different studies, but at least a quarter of people will have at least one day of low back pain in the past few months if you ask them. Now, not all of these patients will come in to seek medical care. Um, so usually when people do come in, it's either because the pain is severe, uh, it's because they may have had a work injury, or it's because the pain is not getting better. Next slide. So when we think about, this is taken from up to date, so you can certainly look in up to date and be able to see it a lot better than on this slide. Um, but this is what you wanna think about when you're thinking about a differential diagnosis for low back pain. And I think it's very helpful to sort of put these into the buckets of, is this mechanical low back pain? So those you would usually be the things like strain, degenerative conditions, herniated discs, spinal stenosis, osteoporosis, fracture, et cetera. The non-mechanical spine conditions would be things that we would be very concerned about, such as malignancies, infections, or inflammatory arthritis. And then don't forget that back pain can actually be referred from some other place in the body. So, and that would depend on, of course, where in the back, we're talking mostly low back pain. 
So again, anything happening in the abdomen or the pelvic region uh, could actually be referred to the low back. So many people may have had a patient with a kidney stone. And as you know, they tend to come in with back pain and fairly uh, bad back pain. Um, so it is something when you're taking your history to be to really ask about where the pain is. Di is it referred from somewhere? Are there any other symptoms so that we don't get anchored just into thinking back pain is only, you know, the back and muscular. Next slide. So let's start out with our first case. So this is a 40 year old male. He comes to the clinic for low back pain. Uh, he works in construction. He states his job is very physical and his back pain started about three days ago. So this is acute low back pain. He took some over the counter Tylenol but didn't think that it was helping. He has some of the pain going into the left buttock area so what key questions do you want to ask? So again, if you could put into the chat, what do you want to know from this patient? What would be helpful for you? I'll wait a couple minutes for some people to type into the chat. Okay, any trauma? History of trauma? Okay. Anything else besides trauma? Numbness or weakness, okay. Okay, infection, injection drug use. Radiation of the pain, okay. Okay, next slide, incontinence. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So this is what we think about, and we do want to make sure that when we are asking a history that we do touch on all of our, what would be considered red flag symptoms or signs. Um, so yes, did they have any trauma? Did they fall? Uh, did the pain come after something particular that they were doing at work? Um, radiation of pain. So radiation is where does it start? Where does it go? Is it coming from somewhere else? You do want to know, ask about a cauda equina symptom. So that would be loss of or problems with bowel or bladder control um, or numbness in the genital area. Uh, you do want to ask about weakness and is that something acute uh, or chronic? Um, you may want to know if they have fever, okay? So thinking of infection. Have they had pain like this before? Is this something that comes and goes? Um, so these, and we know that this particular case is only three days, but if someone has had unremitting pain, again, getting into that subacute or chronic, you would want to ask about that, okay? And really any other symptoms uh, that may be concerning. So a neurologic question. You may want to ask about, does the pain get it better or worse with certain things like walking or lying down or any position change? And we'll do some cases that uh, will help with that. So the reason I like showing uh, this slide in particular is these are ways that your system can actually help you uh, remember some of the things you should ask. So this is uh, what pops up if I want to order an MRI of the back. Uh, because it's going to uh, tell me, do I have any of these symptoms or signs that tell me I should actually be getting an MRI? So if the answer is negative to all of these questions and it's acute low back pain, I probably don't need an MRI. So you're really sort of using your tools to help you. A lot of the um, electronic health records also have templates and in many of those templates, especially for things like low back pain, usually embedded in the questionnaire will be all of your red flag symptoms um, and signs. So that's very helpful to use those templates um, when you're seeing someone. And it's also something that the MA or the nurse uh, could ask the questions of first and then have that in the chart uh, ready for you by the time you go in and see the patient. And then you wanna maybe ask some additional questions 
uh, from the information you get. Next slide. So you definitely want to do a physical exam. Um, I always think it's a really good idea if it's low back pain. I want my patients undressed from the waist down. I usually have them leave the underwear on, uh, but you need to be able to see the skin. You need to be able to see the muscles. You need to be able to uh, get to be able to do your um, deep tendon reflexes. And it's not good to do those uh, through clothing. So undress the patient from the waist down. You want to look at the skin because uh, there could be some skin issues that could cause pain. You do want to palpate the spine and the paraspinous. You may want to also palpate the abdomen and pelvic region to make sure that there isn't a mass or pain coming from that area. Uh, on muscle exam, you look for strength. Um, you look for uh, any atrophy of any of the muscles. You want to check pulses to make sure that there is adequate pulses so that uh, the pain could, it might not be from a claudication or a vascular condition. And then you want to do your full neurologic examination of the low back. So your deep tendon reflexes, you want to check your gait, you want to do straight leg raise testing. Next slide. And then um, someone did mention, well, radiation of pain or numbness in the pain. So I wanted to just remind you of the nerve roots for the lumbar section. So if somebody has an L4 area of injury, you might get pain and numbness going into the front of the thigh. When you're thinking of the L5 slash S1 area, sort of your sciatic area, your pain will usually radiate to the buttock and down below the knee. Okay, radiation into the buttock is fairly common just for acute low back pain or strain, it does not necessarily indicate sciatic. Uh, usually with sciatic, you would want the pain and radiation uh, going much further down the leg. Okay, and then you can also look as, well, what muscles might be weak? So when you test them, uh, you can determine, okay, extension of quadriceps, that goes along more with L4. So your foot dorsiflexion and plantar flexion is your L5 and S1. And then, of course, your uh, deep tendon reflexes. So the knee would be more for L4 and the ankle would be for S1. Next slide. So you do ask all your red flags and he does not have any. He did not fall. And aside from the Tylenol, he hasn't really tried anything else for the pain. Your examination you did on him is completely normal. So he's got normal motor strength, normal deep tendon reflexes. You know, maybe he's walking a little hesitantly because it hurts, but otherwise there is no impairment. So what do you think the next step should be? Would you get a plain film? Would you send him for an MRI? Would you do conservative management? Or would you send him to a chiropractor? So you could just type in uh, the letter. Okay, great. I think this topic has probably been discussed a lot. Yes, conservative management. This is acute, nonspecific low back pain with no red flag signs or symptoms and a normal neurologic examination. So you don't need to get any imaging. Uh, you don't necessarily need to send somebody to a chiropractor. And so conservative management uh, is appropriate and anti-inflammatories probably have the best evidence uh, for helping at least uh, some of the pain control. Next slide. So one of our high value care lessons is, and this has been shown over and over again in multiple studies, it's also part of the Choosing Wisely campaign for at least three different specialty organizations, including radiology, family practice, and internal medicine, is do not obtain imaging studies in patients with nonspecific low back pain without any risk factors or red flags. And there's a lot of evidence. I've given you the references there for that. Next slide. So when we talk about, well, how do I know what is high value care and why should I care about that? So it can really be applied to any presentation. Uh, I'm using it for presentation for low back pain, but you wanna ask yourself, why am I ordering this test? 
Okay, am I ordering this test just because I don't know what to do? Or am I ordering this test for a specific thing I'm concerned about or worried about? Then you have to determine, well, what is the most cost effective and appropriate test to order? So cost effective and appropriate does not always mean cheapest. It may mean a more expensive test if that is a more appropriate test for the presentation. So I'll use the example of severe abdominal pain. So severe abdominal pain, especially if it's nonspecific, somebody comes in, an ultrasound is not the most appropriate or cost-effective test for that presentation. A CT with IV contrast is probably a better test to try to determine what could be the cause of that pain. So again, depending on the presentation of the symptom and what you are concerned about, you want to think about what would be that test. Then you have to ask yourself, well, what am I going to do with the results? So if I already know that for the next couple of weeks that I'm going to treat this patient conservatively with maybe anti-inflammatories if they can take them, then I'm not really doing anything with that result and it's not going to change my immediate management. So those are two things that you wanna ask yourself. What am I gonna do with the result? And oops, we lost the slides. And what am I going to, is it gonna change my management? Kristen, can we get the slides back. Thank you. Um, the other question you do want to ask is, well, what are the potential harms of the test? And while we may not think that an x-ray or a CT um, or an MRI is, you know, a problem, they each have their harms. Number one, for many of these tests, it's radiation. Number two, there is a cost to all of these tests. Number three, if we're thinking of CAT scans or MRIs or something like that, it may use contrast and so that carries some risk as well. And then there is also a risk of what I call uh, false positives or false negatives and stress related to a finding or a small finding that may not be very relevant uh, when you do any uh, of these tests. Next slide. So again, I just wanna show you a couple other slides um, for some of the high value care. This is one about diagnostic imaging um, for low back pain. And again, this was a study, of, we keep losing the slides. Sorry, it's me. There we go. Thank you. Um, so this was actually looking at a systemic review, um, looking at cost. Uh, it was a meta-analysis of at least six randomized controlled trials, so a little over 1,800 patients. And what they were looking at was the difference between those who got some kind of imaging study and those that did not. So they looked at the cost of a spine x-ray, which of course ranged in the hundreds, compared to MRI, which can range into the hundreds to thousands of dollars. And what they found in this study was that there was absolutely no difference between any of the groups there was not any psychologic benefit either. That in general, regardless of whether you imaged or did not image, most patients did improve within four to eight weeks and that it did not affect the treatment plan at all. Um, sometimes the patient satisfaction may be higher. Um, so patients say, well, shouldn't I get one of these tests? And I usually spend more time telling them why it's not necessary. Um, and then there are the harms. So again, the radiation, the labeling, and a higher incidence of back surgery, which we could argue may or may not be necessary. Next slide. So even though all of us mostly know to do conservative management, what do we actually do? So about 40% of family physicians and 13% of internal medicine, and this was physicians, not APPs, uh, reported ordering a routine uh, imaging uh, for pain without any red flags. So again, without any worrisome symptoms, 22% of physicians would order an, uh, an LP and most would order them if they have any quote unquote sciatic type pain. Next slide. And this is looking at um, workman's comp data from Washington state and about health and disability. Again, a non-randomized prospective cohort and these were all people who filed workman's comp claims for nonspecific low back pain. And they looked at doing early MRI uh, in less than six weeks versus evidence-based guidelines, which is again, conservative management and treatment 
uh, usually for four to eight weeks uh, or four to six weeks before anything else. And what they found was that there was no significant difference at a year for either pain or radiculopathy, but those who did go for early MRI had longer disability duration. And the next slide, I'll show you why I think that is. Next slide. So this is a really interesting study. Um, and what this was, uh, was a study of um, patients in the veterans hospital. These were all outpatients who did not, did not have any back pain. It was age stratified. Most of these were men over the age of 50 and they all underwent an MRI. And what they found is that 83% of people without any back pain or concerns of back pain, 83% had disc loss, signal loss, disc height loss, a significant portion had disc bulging, uh, less had disc protrusion or annular tear. And so what we do know, or what we believe from this study is that disc changes in the spine are due to aging, normal aging, not necessarily because that is causing any of the pain. But when you get an image and you find one of these things, then people get labeled. As I say, people get labeled with disc disease. And disc disease is not really um, true when you just have height loss or disc um, bulging or anything uh, related to possible normal wear and tear. So I, I would... If you're interested in this, I would find this study and read it in more detail. Next slide. So we're continuing on with this case. So we've determined that he has a normal exam, normal symptoms, no red flags. So we've already said conservative management, but what, what of the conservative management would be most appropriate? And then I will just talk briefly about workman's comp. Next slide. So which of the following pharmacologic therapies have the best outcome, so the best evidence and data as first-line therapy for low back pain? So you can just type into the chat. Is it opioids, acetaminophen, steroids, or anti-inflammatories? Okay, I already gave this away earlier. So yes, it's the anti-inflammatories. Opioids do not have any reason to give them for first-line therapy for low back pain. Uh, acetaminophen has a little bit of data, but is not as good. Steroids also have very little benefit uh, when it comes to acute low back pain. Um, so your first, um, if you want to use medication, oral medication, your first would be anti-inflammatories, assuming a patient can take those. Next slide. Next slide. So here's some of the data for that. So again, this is a, um, a review, a meta-analysis and systemic review, uh, over 15,000 patients, uh, a very complicated meta-analysis because as you can see, there were 69 different medications that were evaluated in all of these different 98 studies. And what they were really trying to look at was uh, pain intensity, safety, and function. So pain and function are two of the things that I really talk about with my patients uh, to determine if the treatment is actually uh, helping. And when you look at it, uh, anti-inflammatories and muscle relaxers helped pain. Uh, so those did sort of favor treatment. Uh, but no change was noted for the tramadol for multiple different combinations of medicine. Uh, prednisone was actually tending, it's better to use placebo. And then there was a con some concerning safety data, especially for things like um, diazepam, tramadol, which is an opioid, uh, benzodiazepines, and some of the quote unquote muscle relaxers uh, or anti spasm medicines. Um, again, a lot of limitations with this meta-analysis. A lot of this was indirect evidence and um, all the studies have a little different methodology. So it was a very uh, heterogeneous type of a study, um, but the outcomes 
uh, are what they are, low to moderate uh, confidence for um, most actually of all of these therapies. And I'll show that in the next couple of slides. Next slide. Um, and again, another Cochrane review also showed no difference between acetaminophen, little benefit with anti-inflammatories, a little benefit of quote unquote muscle relaxer, but not benzodiazepines. So the muscle relaxers in these studies were things like uh, methocarbamol um, or tizanidine or cyclobenzaprine, but not benzodiazepines. Um, again, there was absolutely no high or even moderate high certainty for any of these pharmacologic uh, interventions. And there was actually a higher risk of adverse events with a lot of the muscle relaxants and opioids. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Next slide. So here's some of the magnitude of the effect on pain um, broken down. Um, so this is actually combining acute and chronic pain. So again, a little bit different than just talking about acute low back pain. Uh, Anti-inflammatories, again, had moderate evidence, but inconsistent results. And tramadol may, which again is an, is an opiate, may or may not have helped function. Maybe it helps a little bit with pain, but it is an opiate. Uh, the effect wears off relatively quickly. And there was very little effect for all of these other medications, uh, which many people uh, sometimes try. Next slide. Some of the harms, of course, um, acetaminophen and duloxetine. Lower harm duloxetine is not a medication I would consider for acute low back pain. Sometimes uh, we may think about different medications for a uh, pain that is more chronic. Uh, and again, medication uh, adverse effects was worse, of course, with anti-inflammatory steroids, opioids, benzodiazepines, um, for all the usual reasons um, of the side effects of those medications. Next slide. And what about non-pharmacologic things? So we talk a lot about, well, what could people do without taking medicine? Well, heat and low to moderate exercise. So to me, that means gentle gentle stretching or walking um, is would be considered low to moderate. That's not bodybuilding, it's not lifting, it's not running or jogging or high impact sports. And heat can be helpful. Some people prefer cold um, or alternating between those two. Um, again, multidiscipline rehab, so physical therapy, uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction, again, that may be to help a little bit with the pain with some deep breathing exercises. And then again, acupuncture had probably more low or low moderate evidence. Uh, the things that had very low evidence were all these other things on the right. So uh, TENS units, ultrasound, spinal manipulation, Tai Chi, massage. Next slide. Uh, but we actually don't really know what harms there are with non-pharma treatments. So because very few studies actually report on the harms of these, uh, most did not see any harm with things like Tai Chi, uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction, multidiscipline rehab, um, acupuncture, although you could argue that it might hurt for some people to have little needles. Um, and again, low quality evidence showed uh, there can actually sometimes be more muscle pain, especially if people are getting massage or deep tendon our, our deep tissue massage uh, early on, sometimes that can actually make the pain worse. Uh, you might get some heat flushing. Um, I actually have had patients who forget uh, to turn off a heating pad and they may sleep on it and they can. you can actually get second or third degree burns. So if I tell people to use heat, I usually say, look, it's on for 20 minutes and then off. If you're using a heating pad, you have to turn it off. Do not fall asleep on a heating pad. Um, because you can give yourself burns. Um, and again, spinal manipulation uh, can also be associated with um, soreness, could increase pain. Uh, I worry more about spinal manipulation, especially for the neck, because it is a much more sensitive area, and you could actually do damage um, to the vessels uh, and the nerves in that area. Next slide. Um, and again, what we really don't know is we don't really know the best evidence for the treatment of radicular pain. So if you want to say sciatic pain or anything, is it really any different than the other just general acute low back pain? And again, as I mentioned, most of the studies I presented mixed acute, subacute, and chronic pain. 
And so really trying to tease out, well, what's better for this versus that is very hard to do. Um, also, uh, which patients would benefit the most from physical modalities like uh, physical rehab, uh, physical therapy, and then also, except for a couple of the studies I showed, the evidence on disability outcomes was a little bit lacking. Most of the studies didn't really show much difference with imaging early on, but it's unclear about which treatment uh, had, leads to less disability in the long run. Next slide. And I did just wanna say, um, I was just asked to sort of put in one comment about workman's comp, and these are just my pearls. So I am not a workman's comp expert. I am not a lawyer. I have filled out workman's comp claims in FMLAs. So what I would say is this, if you have somebody who has who's coming in because this is an on-the-job injury, on-the-job low back pain, and for our patient who's 40 who works in construction, I would need to find out, did you injure yourself on the job? Are you claiming this as a workman's comp? If they are, they need to have told their supervisor uh, that they are filing a claim they need to fill out paperwork. So there's usually a form that has to be filled out that they need to first fill out. And then there's a portion for the clinician. You need to document your history and your physical exam findings extremely well. Um, you can complete your part of the questionnaire, um, but I normally don't do that until the patient part is filled in completely. There may be other forms that have to be filled out after that initial workman's comp. Um, I would recommend that if you're going to do this as a on-the-job injury and the patient does want to claim this as a workman's comp, that you only deal with that at that issue because it's very challenging to deal with that and then other things because all of that information, if they want the records, is going to be uh, visible or available. Uh, so I wouldn't try to mix appointments to do an on-the-job injury and something else as well. Um, I always recommend that you merely state things honestly according to your findings and the history given and then what your recommendations are. And you want to recommend, write your recommendations in your um, assessment and plan, whether you think the person should be quote unquote off work or have a modified work. So many times if somebody uh, has a very physical job uh, and they have to lift a lot of things and they have a low back pain, I might write into my note, you know, acute low back strain, recommend uh, no heavy lifting uh, for two weeks and then reassess. So it's not up to me to determine if there is another job at their site that they can do something that isn't as strenuous. I merely state what I am recommending for a patient, okay, not lifting so much. Um, you know, walking, having ability to walk, maybe need it, getting a stand sit desk. If it's a problem of sitting at a desk and getting low back pain from having a bad setup. Um, so again, I always say just honest, you do not give somebody disability. Um, you are merely stating uh, what the history is, the exam, and then what your recommendation is. Next slide. Okay, let's go to our next case. 75-year-old um, female comes to clinic with severe low back pain. She just slipped off her bed and she kind of landed on her buttock about a day ago. The pain is located to one area of her spine. There are other red flags that you have now asked are negative and she has some tenderness over the spinous process kind of in the low back area, but the remainder of the examination is normal. So now what would you recommend doing for this patient? Do you, let me just ask it a different way. Would you or would you not get imaging for this patient? Yes or no, you can just type into the chat. Okay, next slide. Yeah, so here is a case that an X-ray of the spine, low spine would be recommended. So she's an older patient and she fell. So even though it's not a long height, or even though it might've just been a slide onto the bed, she still fell and landed and has severe back pain. So really in someone like this, what you're going to be looking for is evidence of a compression fracture. Uh, this is especially true in women or anyone who might have osteoporosis. Next slide. And what you can see, again, the 
thankful arrow um, that shows you there is the compression fracture that you have. So, um, so this can be helpful to merely make the diagnosis um, and then help to manage them appropriately, uh, probably for osteoporosis and uh, the back pain. Next slide. So compression fractures we know are much more common in older patients. Uh, risk is frailty, osteoporosis, any trauma. You do want to treat underlying osteoporosis, so making sure they're getting adequate vitamin D and calcium, uh, and bisphosphonates if there is no contraindication. Um, and then typically anti-inflammatories, if they are able, would still be the preferred uh, medication of initial first choice, not opioids. And again, you're talking about an elderly person who already has fallen. So opioids or, or uh, muscle relaxers, which are really mostly sedatives, uh, actually could make falling increase, uh, falling risk worse. And then you want to avoid steroids, especially if there's osteoporosis. You might want to think about getting them into gentle early physical therapy just to help with balance. Um, the pain usually needs to be a little bit reduced sometime, but that can help. Um, how can you tell a new from an old compression fracture? Um, I, that's an excellent question. Uh, if you have old films, that's very helpful. Your radiologist may be very helpful to tell you, does it look new or does it look old? So again, I'm not a radiologist, um, but I'm sure there are different bone changes that happen if something has been a, a fracture that's been around longer. Uh, but that would be a good question to ask the radiologist. Next slide. Okay, our next case is a 53-year-old, 55-year-old, sorry, um, who's coming in with fatigue and sudden back pain. Describes this as severe, persistent, not getting better with lying down. He's tried over-the-counter medicine, so he's tried anti-inflammatories and Tylenol or acetaminophen. <laughs> on his exam, his neurologic exam is normal, but he has some pallor. He's non-tender on palpation of the back and the remainder of the exam, aside from those, is unremarkable. Next slide. <laughs> so here again, excuse me. Here again is someone who has a red flag, okay? It's got fatigue. It's got pallor on exam. Um, that is not a normal finding. And so getting a few studies, right, go back, go back, go back. Thank you. Getting a couple studies, you show that he is anemic. His sedimentation rate is elevated for his age. <laughs> now, what would you want to do? And you can type into chat. Okay, so I'm seeing more people would like um, <laughs> um, some kind of imaging uh, more robust than an X-ray. Um, so I saw MRI, CT, and PET scan. I would say not a PET scan, not at this stage. Um, to me, a PET scan is um, mostly a specialty um, organized uh, test order, usually from oncology, um, if you have made that diagnosis. So I would not use that as a diagnostic test. Uh, that would be something that might be down the road, depending on what you find with your initial studies. Next slide. Yeah, so this gets us to a concern that this could be a cancer as a cause. And so looking at um, sedimentation rate, you can sort of see the sensitivity and specificity listed there. Um, so again, a high sedimentation rate is specific that there is something else going on. Does not necessarily mean it's a cancer because infections, autoimmune conditions can also have high sedimentation rates. Um, but if it's over 50, typically, and certainly if it's over 100, you're going to go looking for what could be causing that. Anemia also has a lot of specificity, especially if you have a hematocrit below 30, uh, and then a very high white count, again, thinking of um, some kind of malignancy. 
um, also has high specificity, not a lot of sensitivity. Um, so if it's if it's absent, it doesn't help you. If it's present, then it does give you some idea of which direction to go. And yes, somebody in the chat recommended also getting alk -FOS, a CRP, um, maybe iron studies, um, and other imaging. Next slide. Okay, you can't read this. This is from up to date, but I just wanted to show you that there is an algorithm and when you might consider imaging um, for your acute low back pain. Okay, so you can go ahead and read this. And again, at every step, it's either conservative management going all the way down or when you should really think about doing some more urgent uh, imaging studies. Next slide. So you might get, let's say you're thinking, hmm, anemia, pain, I'm thinking cancer. There's all different kinds of cancers can do this. If you were to do an x-ray of the head and you see all these punched out lesions, this is uh, most likely going to be a multiple myeloma, which is a condition that could present with fatigue, could present with anemia. It might present uh, with pain. Next slide. So other malignancies to think about, again, um, solid cancers, especially those that can metastasize to bone. So the prostate, the breast, lung, kidney, and thyroid usually account for about 80% of skeletal metastases. And so, yes, maybe you're thinking this is a malignancy. You're going to do just the lab studies. Maybe you get an imaging study of that low back pain. Maybe you start with a plain x-ray to see if you can see any lytic lesions um, or something like that. But most likely, if you're starting to suspect this could be malignancy, you're most likely also going to be referring onto your specialist for uh, the more intense bone marrow studies or something else that may be needed. Um, or if you think, if you see lytic lesions or spots um, or non-lytic lesions in the bone, again, you may need some other kind of imaging study uh, to try to determine what the primary could be. Next slide. Okay, case four. Um, a 60-year-old comes to your clinic with severe low back pain, uh, stating that, gosh, it just feels like it's on fire. It's like, oh, an intense burning pain. Started about a week ago. Again, tried all the over-the-counter treatments, tried the topicals, tried the anti-inflammatories, tried the acetaminophen. There are no other acute red flag symptoms. And so, as I said, you definitely want to make sure people get undressed um, so you can look the normal uh, neurologic exam um, and no other findings. And on her back, you tend to notice, next slide, this, okay, unilateral rash. So I think everybody probably knows what this is. Um, so this is actually herpes zoster shingles. And it can present before the lesions show up with excruciating back pain. And this is a condition that I have been fooled by um, when someone comes in before the rash. Uh, and I've done a you know different workup and because you know the pain wasn't getting better. Until you see the rash, it's actually very hard to make this diagnosis. But you do want to think about it and you definitely want to make sure you check the skin to see if there's any evidence uh, for this condition. And again, there may be other medications you may want to try for treating this more neuropathic type of pain. Um, again, the evidence for the medications is very sparse, uh, but things like gabapentin or tricyclics, um, usually not opioids, they tend not to work very well for this, nor does actually anti-inflammatories work very well in my experience. Next slide. <clears throat> So we all know that uh, zoster is the reactivation of chickenpox. It tends to be unilateral and in usually a single dermatome or in dermatomes that are right next to each other. The risk, of course, goes up with age or immune suppression. Uh, very hard to treat pain, and actually the pain can last a long time, long after the lesions go away. Um, if it's acute uh, zoster or shingles, you could treat that with the acyclovir or valacyclovir. Uh, sometimes that can help a little bit of the pain, um, but you may also need to give something for the pain. And of course, what we would really want to try to prioritize 
is vaccinating our patients who are 50 or older to try to prevent this from happening. So the new uh, shingles vaccine is about 80 to 90% effective at reducing the risk of reactivation of chickenpox. Next slide. Okay, next case. <clears throat> and if you have questions, please feel free to type them into the chat or if there's any coming up the Q&A. Um, a 22 year old comes in with low back pain. The pain is worse in the morning, better with exercise. No red flag signs or symptoms. The exam is normal. You referred him to physical therapy and it helped. Uh, but then after six weeks, he came back because the pain is still there. So the plain x-rays are done and they're normal. So what else is in your differentials? So somebody's already starting to type into the chat. Feel free to type in what else do you think this could be? So I have a couple responses for some kind of rheumatologic thing I'm worried about here. Um, yeah, so I would say, so now we have a young person um, who has chronic pain, right? It's over six weeks. Um, so he already had the pain, then you sent him for physical therapy, and then he came back after six weeks. So it's been a long time that he's had pain. Um, so you definitely think, what else could this be? And so next slide. Yeah, so you do want to think about, so ankylosing spondylitis is just one possibility, but it's something you might want to consider a young person with recurrent back pain that seems to be worse in the morning. So after resting, maybe a little better with exercise. And again, it's due to inflammation of the axial skeleton, uh, usually presents before they are 40. You want to ask about other symptoms that could go along with it. So uh, uveitis, radiculitis, central um, nervous or other uh, systems, you wanna start out with your sedimentation rate, CRP, maybe consider an HLA uh, B27. You could also, again, do a friendly call to a rheumatologist and say, I have somebody I'm concerned about this. What studies should I get before I refer them? Unless you're going to be managing um, the spondylitis. And typically, if you do an x-ray, you want to focus on the SI joints because those tend to show problems earlier on than a plain fill of the low back. Um, you might need an MRI to actually see that uh, or to detect it early because, again, the x-ray itself may not have any changes early on. And then you definitely would want some specialty advice or specialty care uh, because there is specific treatment uh, for uh, the autoimmune rheumatologic conditions. Next slide. And this is bamboo spine. This is what we want to avoid, which is why early diagnosis and treatment is necessary. By the time they actually get to this, this is this is un, this is not treatable in terms of reversing this. So this condition doesn't reverse. So we would want to uh, prevent this from happening because this is a significant impairment of someone's spine and could lead to ongoing more chronic pain. Next slide. Okay, um, our, I think this is our last case. Uh, this is an 85 year old male and he's coming in with low back pain and pain that's going down his legs when he walks. It's worse with walking, seems to be better with resting. Definitely feels better if he bends over when he walks. And on his exam, he's got kyphosis. The pulses seem to be intact. Uh, on the lower legs, you do not see any edema or skin breakdown, and he does seem to have um, normal neurologic exam, except he's walking with kind of a slow sort of antalgic gait. Um, given his age, um, you might get plain x-rays. Um, and what would you expect to see? What do you think this is? What does this sound like? I'll wait for a minute in the chat. Okay, so I don't see anybody guessing. Oh, oh we got a couple. Okay, um, yes, vascular insufficiency, spinal stenosis. 
Yeah. So those are definitely good suggestions. So this sounds leg pain worse with walking uh, could be claudication or pseudoclaudication. Okay. So claudication is when there actually is a vascular insufficiency, um, usually arterial um, or pseudoclaudication where you have pain that sounds like claudication, but actually vascularly they are intact. And that is something you can see with spinal stenosis. Next slide. So if you were to do an x-ray, you might see something like this. So you can uh, see all this thickening um, along the spine, um, spondylolisthesis and things like that. The radiologist will certainly call this out. Uh, which could be what an x-ray looks like when you have spinal stenosis. Next slide. And then again, this is again from up to date. Um, this just serves to show you what the normal anatomy is um, of a spinous process. And then what you might see if there is um, different things, spondylolisthesis, so that could be where things are moving or thickening um, into uh, the areas between um, the processes um, or disc protrusion, herniated disc, uh, as was seen here. Next slide. Oops, no, yeah. Um, so as we know, spinal stenosis is due to narrowing of the spine. It can put pressure on the nerves and it can cause thickening of ligaments in there. Again, typically uh, back pain or radiation down the legs they may, might only present with leg pain, okay? So that referred pseudoclaudication. So they may not have back pain at all. Um, you typically better with rest or bending over kind of to alleviate some of that pressure. And it is very important if I were to get an 85 who had this, I would make sure I do some kind of, um, you know, uh, 